Hello, good afternoon and welcome back to the start of the third series of Meet the Scholar um, webinar series hosted by Club Soda, who are always eager to engage with the academic community and inform their approach to mindful drinking through the latest findings. And, and this is one way of doing that and bringing some of that um, intel to sort of the public audience. So I'm Claire Davy, a PhD student at Canterbury Christchurch University, um, studying in the field of alcohol studies, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion as with the previous episodes. And I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Chelsea Flood. Um, so Chelsea is a senior lecturer in creative writing at the University of West England. Um, but more excitingly, she is the author of award-winning novels, Infinite Sky and Night Wanderers and the author of two blogs as well, which we're going to discuss in more detail today, A Beautiful Hangover, about alcohol and finding freedom in sobriety, and more recently, Polite Robot, um, which is a blog that discusses her late diagnosis and experiences of autism. And as we'll explore further, uh, the two are not indivisible. So today we'll take the form of more of an informal discussion with Chelsea. Please do drop your comments underneath whichever platform you're viewing this on, on Facebook or YouTube, and and I'll try to work those in and ask them to, well, you know, put them to Chelsea for her to answer. So um, without further ado, hi, Chelsea. Hi, Claire. Hello. And how are you doing? I'm doing really well, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And it's listening to you talk about that. It's so important to get all of the information out of academia into, you know, just into the into the mainstream or just into everyday conversations. So it's great that you're doing this. Yeah, it's because uh, we last saw each other at the Drinking Studies Network conference, which was last, not this weekend, just gone, but the weekend before, which mm -hmm. is actually quite interdisciplinary, right, and outside of the academic community. But I'm conscious that it's always academics talking to academics about their research rather than the people who may also benefit from that research, which could be those who are in Club Soda. So it is great that you just, you know, you agreed to come on and I'm sure we'll sort of tap into some of that. Um, discussion that you presented at the conference as well but hopefully more of an informal approach um, so if okay with you could we start back where you know you came to a decision to stop drinking um, and sort of talk us through that process and how how it was for you mm -hmm. yeah that was um so it was in 2000 and 16 perhaps and it had been it was a long time coming to finally quit so it had been a year or two years of of thinking that I would probably benefit from quitting and then finding myself unable to actually quit and just being stuck in that really frustrating cycle of making promises to myself and then breaking promises to myself and and eventually this the sort of pain of that led me to go to an AA meeting and that's how I quit was via AA and um and it was it was really difficult for me because I felt like I didn't fit AA very much because there's just you know that stereotype of the chronic alcoholic and the physically dependent alcoholic and everyone in AA wasn't actually saying that that was how you had to be at all but there were alcoholics of that caliber there that, and then I would compare myself to them and I'd think oh this is a bit over the top I don't need to be here or you know it's a bit embarrassing that I'm here or something you know can't I just deal with my problems without needing this this hardcore approach or you know there's a lot of that sort of thing but nonetheless it did actually work for me and people in AA were incredibly welcoming and they helped me understand that um, you know addiction can look like lots of different things and lots of different people but the essential core of it is the same which is that you want to stop drinking and you can't stop drinking or you can't drink safely when you, when you drink and uh so so that's that's how I got sober and I also I read lots of books uh which is one of the things I talked about at the conference I read I don't know if I've read all of the sobriety memoirs by women but I've had a good go at reading nearly all of them and um and so that was a part of the process as well. I found reading was a really crucial part of helping me to quit, learning how addiction works as well. So things like This Naked Mind and um, and some other books, maybe the Alan Carr book. Uh, so learning about how addiction works and about how the drink, you know, the big alcohol industry works and 
kind of getting that intellectual understanding of what was going on as well. And I suppose through that process of reading so much and having all of these experiences in how in order to learn how to live without drinking, I um I started to just be have so many opinions and thoughts and feelings, often confusing ones about what I was going through, which is why I started beautiful hangover and it was partly as well because I wanted to join the conversation that I felt was playing out about alcohol and the way that we celebrate it and kind of covet it and the way that lots of people seem to have a bit of a problem but that's more okay than actually admitting you have a problem and and starting to you know really deal with it so I, I was finding like all of these really interesting things that I wanted to write about and because it's kind of a confusing area, isn't it? There's like, you know, there's disagreements and, and conflict about what makes a drinking problem and what is an alcoholic and is the word alcoholic even okay to use? And so there's kind of a lot to talk about in there. Yeah, and I think your, you know, your blog, you started writing your blog and, and I think at a time when there was um, an increase in voices having those discussions of of does this label fit is this the only label I can have and predominantly actually that were had by women right so women seem to be driving this discussion and I include probably Laura Willoughby in this with Club Soda and obviously her co-founders who are uh, not not female but um, then you know we had this more of a discussion led from the US but yours was a blog which sort of gained momentum but based in the UK which added a nice sort of reflection to it. Yeah I noticed that too that the conversations seem to be being held by women, white women generally and often American women yeah. and um, and the, one of the things that I was really interested in and again a bit unsure about was hip sobriety as it was called then and um, and how that compared with AA because AA is so unhip and I think anyone who want, who first goes to AA immediately is like, oh, we need to reform this. We need to get out of these church basements and into more sort of, a, you know, warm environments and make it co cozy and make it cool. Like you can't help but think that. But the whole thing with AA is like it's about letting go of being cool. Like it's about it's not about being cool anymore, which you think can be a big thing with drinking. You know, it can feel like it's part of your sort of edgy identity and it can be hard to let go of that. Um, so I always find that a really interesting kind of comparison to have the way that hip sobriety is presented while going to AA meetings and um, and wondering about the different experience I'd have if I'd sort of had an alternate route but then like beautiful hangover I just wanted to I suppose yeah be that kind of UK voice because that like you say there there definitely were them as well but I felt like it there weren't as many and I felt like um, I just felt like I had something to say on the subject and actually to be honest I felt like I was just there was like an outpouring of thoughts and ideas because my whole belief system had to change for me to get sober, which wasn't really something that I had expected. It was quite a strange, a strange experience. So I found myself really ins inspired by it. Yeah. And so did you start Beautiful Hangover on sort of day one of sobriety? like, Or were you finding sobriety as you were, you know, writing the blog? Did it help you gain sobriety? Does that make sense? At what point yeah, did it totally start? Yeah, it makes sense. So I didn't start it straight away, although I, I I probably wouldn't have been able to start it straight away, but I was I was wanting to write about the experience I was having by about nine months probably, but also I wasn't sure enough that I would be able to stay sober, that I wanted to actually, uh, you know, publish anything. I also felt quite ashamed that I'd had to get sober. It felt like a failure on my part that I wasn't able to just drink like seemingly everyone else in the world at that time. Um, so it took me maybe two and a half years to feel kind of confident enough in the writing and and in my sort of new identity as a sober person to to publish the blog. And then I can't remember what the other question was. I've forgotten. Um, now <laughs> I can't either. But another question has come to mind, which is sort of like as you were going through through that process of writing for the blog did you at ever point any point sort of like start questioning or was it a process of questioning your beliefs as you were writing the blog or did you feel ever sort of like questioning or triggered by writing the blog I think sometimes reflecting on past drinking continuously can sometimes mm. be quite difficult yeah that's true 
I, I kind of went through all of those different things and then I just used it to create more blog posts because, I mean, I am a writer, obviously, and I teach creative writing and I often feel much more comfortable in my written personality than in, in my speaking personality. So that's just how I process things and actually how I like to engage in the world, really. So I, I just all of those things, those contradictions and and the sort of like, yeah, that, you know, there'd be certain points where I'd come back from an AA meeting and then I'd be Googling, is AA a cult? You know, things like that. <laughs> not, not very helpful. Oh, no. okay. so I'd be on the one hand really getting a lot out of it. And then on the other hand, undermining myself by Googling these things. And, and then I'd like write a blog post about it to kind of try and process what on earth I thought about all of these different things. So I think that's, it was really a, a testing ground for me working out what I thought. And as an academic, I pretty much, I mean, I don't know if this is as an academic, but I pretty much never arrive at a stance. You know, I just, the questions just continue and I learn more about it and I, I become less confident that I'm sure I could say anything at all about the subject that I've become interested in. Yeah, it's sort of that negotiating your positionality within that space <laughs> and then sort of there is yeah. an evolution in that as well, right? So, you know, it well, due to personal growth and the more you engage with different ideas and things like that, you sort of do have to evolve. Mm. So I could almost go back now and look at my earlier posts and, and start to do a sort of cri a critique of those earlier <laughs> posts and, and what I used to think and the sort of um, the bias that I didn't understand I had at the time and and all of that but I think that's what's great about a blog it's just got you know it's all there now and and my interests have moved on as we'll talk about a bit later I suppose um so I don't necessarily have as much to say on that subject but I've got all of all of that writing is there so I can kind of go back in into it and I am working on a book to sort of pull out um to pull out the more interesting parts of it or the you know the things that I feel like I really did manage to articulate things that had confused me for so long and I actually managed to articulate them very clearly. Yes, I agree. Um, so I was just Googling, I'm not Googling you because obviously I know who you are, but there was a post that I wanted <laughs> to talk about, about that kind of evolutionary process. But um, just to quickly sort of dive into that. So when, just think about your writing and the drinking and so on. So your novels, how did you negotiate writing them through this sort of journey um so do you mean do you mean in terms of how drinking impacted that or do you mean yes like how yeah, yeah. okay yeah um well it's quite interesting in my first novel and my second novel alcohol is very much present in them which is interesting because I think that was it for me it was so so normalized to be a drinker and for al alcohol to just be a very omnipresent thing and in both stories there's a little a little bit of that in there which I find quite interesting now because to me then it was invisible um and I think my the second book was when my drinking start it's almost like there's these two parts of me the the writer part that was doing well and succeeding and then the drinker part that from the perspective of drink was doing well and succeeding you know I was I was sort of the two stars were ascending together but they didn't go very well and um and so my drinking started to really get in the way of my performance as a writer and it was affecting my mental health and it was affecting my ability to to think straight, really. I mean, um, like I was saying, it's hard to kind of arrive at a resolution of what you believe anyway. And I was finding that my natural sort of questioning nature plus all the hangovers and the sort of anxiety from drinking was just leaving me very jumbled and I was finding it really hard to finished this second book and um I kept missing deadlines and it was starting to really get in the way of how I was working and and that was a big part of why I got sober as well actually because I just it was starting to really impact noticeably my work I mean it impacted my my work all along but I suppose maybe the stakes were higher now because um you know I it was my dream always to be an author so when I felt like it was getting in the way of that I remember articulating it to myself that I just wasn't able to operate at this new level and drink how I drank. So it was almost it was it worked well enough before when I was a student, when I was a waitress, I could manage all of the things. But like at this new level, I couldn't I couldn't manage it all. And so drinking kind of had to go. Yeah, I, 
a similar, my sort of realization moment was relatively similar and that it was connected to writing. And I was trying, I was like the crunch point of my master's thesis. Mm. And I just woke up one morning and I was like, I just don't have the creative expansive ability, you know, to handle some of these concepts and write and deliver on it if I want to continue sort of like drinking in that way. And so it's kind of like you either move forward with this, but you can't take this with you, you know? And so that was quite a hard, hard decision. But at the time there was a kind of like a greater good, do you know what I mean? Like you'd worked this hard for to this goal only to, with the risk of losing it at that point, you know, it didn't mm -hmm. seem worth it. Um, one thing from my own research around uh, some of the women that are active in this space and and things like social media and blogs and that are, I think your blog is quite unique in the sense that you've managed to sustain it over a long period of time beyond this sort of immediate sobriety phase right this kind of like pink cloud sort of like mm. uh epiphany stage and it has had some longevity and I note that you know one of your most recent posts was around the fact that the real cost of drinking isn't revealed until way onwards and so I guess that's where you're sort of taking that blog but to define a, a, an actual question in there was is you know congratulations on making it for this long with the blog but how how have you sort of managed to sustain that and then you know the findings that you've or realizations that you've come to later on in sobriety yeah, I mean, at the start, it was it was certainly easier because I had, like I say, I had this, I was almost overwhelmed with ideas and thoughts and quite a lot of anger and regret and lots of different emotions to process, which made it easy to come up with different ideas uh, on the subject. And then I entered a period where it was more like, um, it was more like a project that I was committed to and I was it was much more like really brainstorming for ideas and it wasn't so much just this passionate outpouring. It was more thinking about, yeah, like digging a bit deeper and what else do I have to say? And by then I actually had quite a lot of readers as well. So that helped on the one hand because I would get some good questions or comments in posts could then inspire me to write something. But then also I, I did notice that there were certain things that it was, you know, like if I wrote about certain things that would be more popular and so I got I got a little bit trapped into a listicle producing um, hamster wheel of my own creation for a while. And then uh, and then I and then I actually reached out to my readers and I, I just sort of said, I'm kind of, you know, I'm moving on with my life and I want to write about different things. And so I'm going to keep the blog running, but I'm going to sometimes write just about what it's like to be sober at sort of five years or, you know, I'm going into six years soon in April not that soon but um so I kind of uh reached out to people and then so now I think of the blog as being a place to follow you know follow what happens afterwards as well which is harder to write about actually so it's maybe a little bit broad so we'll see how how that how that goes yeah I I empathize with that in the sense that uh, my research is sort of focused on women's sobriety after that initial six month period, which is when things start to sort of like calm down, you know, you reach a level of normality, you've, you've sort of done some of those first things mm -hmm. in sobriety. And it, you're right, the writing about those experiences, it can seem a bit more mundane, but actually, it's still valid to talk about right so how how do you live a long-term life in sobriety what are the normal practices or you know how do you navigate relationships family issues like in that mm. time as well without alcohol yeah because that's the thing that was such a revelation to me and which is what can makes me continue to be I suppose amazed by the process of getting sober which is that that that, that it does continue that that sort of um that development and improvement of relationships maybe especially in like learning how to communicate in relationships and sort of just do a little bit better yourself in relationships and and um and things like that I, f I do find it still things are still changing and I can still be struck by how different my life is now and so I, I quite like to write to continue to write with that sort of lens where you're still thinking about 
what it, it might have it's almost like yeah like the parallel lives of what it might have been like if you hadn't have quit because I believe that I and I'll never know this um hopefully I won't know this but I believe I probably could have just kept drinking as I drank and I just would have had a worse quality of life but I could have you know I, I could have kind of continued in that way and I never would have known the things that I found out in the process of quitting drinking and I find that very alarming the fact that I could have just I guess this is when I get into my like wanting to make everyone get sober which I try and I try not to be like that and I try and be more open about people's drinking and nowadays oh, like five years sober I can manage that but that was quite hard one to be at all neutral around people's drinking but sometimes I just think like with certain people they will never know whether it will be better for them or not unless they get sober and stay sober for like five years um yeah so I don't know really where I was going with that <laughs> but that's I've said some things about that and so what were the most sort of surprising things I guess to you um having reached sort of a stable sobriety um well what a massive dork I am which shouldn't have been a surprise Sh really shouldn't have been a surprise but I think I'd bought my own like pretending to be cool kind of vibe um so yeah just a major dork and very into creature comforts and really like being home with a blanket <laughs> and yes. um yeah I think I think also what's surprising is I wasn't aware of how much I had a part in certain things that were happening in my life so like unsuccessful relationships for instance so I've, I've been pleasantly surprised at how much better I can be at you know being a friend and being a partner and even being a daughter and a sister you know just sort of being able to be more present on a daily basis just makes a huge difference to my quality of life. Yeah like your so, own sense of agency which you know when there's alcohol involved it you know you you might or you tell yourself as well that you didn't have agency in certain situations. Yeah and I think also in AA they say something like I never can remember which is probably good and that's how I know I'm not in a cult something like um you get your wildest dreams or something like that I can't remember the quote and I was always waiting to see if I would get my wildest dreams and what they would be and it always seemed a bit sort of far-fetched but I think the thing is is that when you're not drinking and sort of then having to navigate the the problems that are created whatever that looks like for you so for me it was a lot of just anxiety and um, depression and sluggishness and less time to work because I didn't feel very well I mean and I don't want to make it all about productivity but things that I really wanted to do like finish my book for instance um, and I've forgotten where I was going with that as well um, it, you were talking about sort of your wildest dream you know AA's oh, yeah, dreams and... so that's something that continues like what your wildest dreams look like so when you're not sort of losing all of that time to the drinking and the being hungover you can just be making small steps towards various things that that you would like to happen in your life and you know it's not like it's just a wish fulfillment factory out here or anything but you can just make your life really suit you and um and and sort of make things happen that when you're in when I was in the drinking I could be quite defeatist and just think that nothing ever worked out for me without realizing how much I was having a part in things not working out for myself and and now more things you know I don't get everything I want of course but more things work out for me because I can just plod along moving in the right sort of direction and um and that's again like a, a huge improvement so I, I feel like you know wildest dreams I think they can really come true in a sort of very gradual way which yeah, I think you had the energy, right, to dedicate to things which you didn't before, which makes mm. it seem like less of a mountain to climb. And then I think, you know, my interpretation of the wildest dreams thing is not necessarily that it gives you um, lots of glorious golden things, but what it does give you is that stable base, right, to mm. then build upon and focus on things. And actually, if the underlying foundations are shaking and crumbling at the seams and causing all sorts of chaos, you know, you can never quite build that next level on top, right? 
exactly because some people manage to be that that um the high functioning alcoholic and i've never really felt that i fit that label because i don't feel like i was that high functioning um as a person and i also thought it was quite interesting that i didn't even drink that much like i wasn't that high functioning and i wasn't that bad an alcoholic which might be you know when we find out later on later on spoiler alert that i'm autistic um, <laughs> shock <laughs> like know. sorry i mean shock from the description of the event not shock because they've been listening no, no. and seeing you <laughs> no, but it, wasn't, it was a shock that's the thing i, was, I mean it was like oh yes that does make sense but also i hadn't seen that coming at all mm. but i think that explains why alcohol was such a problem for me um particularly because i actually find it quite hard to keep up and manage life anyway so you put drinking in which on the one hand was really helping me function and socialize and i had a pretty good social life but the other parts of my life weren't working out very well at all because like i wasn't able to sort of keep it all together and drink um not that i'm recommending being a high functioning alcoholic but it's it's just something that some people sort of can manage to really operate at a very high level like having a family having a, a, a job with positions of power and you know and and drinking you know like the pain of maintaining all of that I can't I can't really imagine but I'm always sort of so interested in that and I think that the memoirs that I read often were about high functioning mm. American white women alcoholics and um and like reading it I did always feel like that wasn't really my experience or my story at all yeah, I guess there's two two factors sort of there it is one, you know, is the, you know, the stereotype of high functioning alcoholic, are, are we ascribing sort of, um, you know, a race to that and essentially then saying, you know, does society feel that you, you know, uh it's less socially acceptable to be an alcoholic if you're not a white high earning individual. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think you know, from the data that's available, it is mostly high income earners that are the most the biggest drinkers it's just that they suffer the least sort of like uh social and physical harms as a result of drinking so they don't always present for treatment so it just creates that skew of what we and is believe. that because of them them being kind of protected because of those are the parts of their life like so they're protected by money and yeah i mean that's you know I guess that the, I'm sure there's a lot more research out there to sort of suggest these reasons but I mean you know we could say well high income earners are likely to have private medical right so already mm. you know they're likely to pick up issues earlier and faster um, and maybe have better access to treatment you've also got the fact that you know high income earners have got that financial stability at home perhaps people managing their home right in a way that other people don't have access to so somebody is going to be picking up those kids they don't have to do it you know somebody's cleaning their house they don't have to do it you know all these things tie in um as to just sort of reduces the responsibility in some ways um on those individuals so it becomes less chaotic i guess um yeah but I mean, as well, even analysis. I was definitely buffered in some ways because I used to borrow a lot of money off my parents, for instance, mm. because I couldn't, I couldn't ever quite sort of handle my financial situation. But I was buffered from that because my parents always would step in and help me out. And I've heard a lot of people in the rooms of AA that have that experience, and I've heard a lot of people that didn't have that experience, you know. And and there is definitely that like that buffer makes a huge difference. Yeah, like how fast do you hit rock bottom is determined upon the, you know, financial ability of those around you, right? And I think probably more so from a US standpoint where uh, there's less public health, you know, intervention and, and so on. Mm. Um, cool. So I just noticed that your, your latest blog post was about a high functioning, <laughs> how to tell if you're a high functioning alcoholic and ah. so... Yeah, that's that's that. that's not a that's um an evergreen post, but it's always popular, so I put it at the top. Right. So clearly, people are concerned. You know, if it's one of the most clicked on, oh, do you think yeah. it's it is? It's it's one of the most clicked on by quite a long way. Sort of tens of thousands of people are worrying that they're a high functioning alcoholic or questioning it. Interesting. So the, I guess the discussion that we've just had might sort of highlight some of the, some of the or answer some of their questions in that way. Mm. 
Cool. So I'm conscious that, you know, we had this other part to you or other blog as well to talk about, which is Polite Robot. And you started writing about issues of alcohol and autism on your Beautiful Hangover blog and then decided mm. that it sort of needed a, a dedicated home. When you were in sobriety and thinking, um, well, you reached stabil some stability, but what made you think, OK, maybe there's still something there that I haven't uncovered? Um, so I got sober and then I got my I got my first job in academia full time. So I'd been working in academia as an associate lecturer for a while, but I'd always just had one module. So it's sort of, you know, three hours a week. Um, and I got my first full time position. And I th again, I think it was a little bit of that operating at a new level because I'd never I'd never had uh I'd never had a post like that and been actually on the faculty and been responsible for so many students and had such a high workload as well, honestly. And I found myself making a lot of infuriating mistakes to do with organisation and knowing what day it is and having almost no short term memory. So, so infuriating. Um, and, and I just was noticing, you know, I can be very skilled in certain areas. I know a lot about how, you know, literature and creative writing and my my interests or my special interests, as, as they're called in the world of autism. Um, but then I could be almost clueless about other things that I know it felt like my colleagues knew about. And of course, there's a little bit of measure. You shouldn't really measure your insides against people's outsides, of course, but you know certain things my colleagues just didn't seem to have any issue with and I'd be spending ages trying to do them trying to keep up with certain administrative processes and and then also the other main thing was the social anxiety that I would I would experience so when I was teaching I was just getting I would have like these massive sweat attacks and um and they just wouldn't go anywhere even even when it went well it, you know I just would have like this intense sweating it was like it was as if, sort of thing yeah it was just as if everyone looking at me just freaked me out and the fact that I was at the front and center stage which of course you are when you're the lecturer no matter how much I tried to make it I'd always I always try and make it not like everyone looking at me as much as possible but of course I am just leading the workshop and there's no getting away from it so the social anxiety it just didn't seem to ever dial down you know no matter how much I got to know my students how much I was sure of the material how much I came to enjoy the particular dynamic of the group. It was like, it was just always there. So they were the main things. And at first I didn't think, I had, I never thought it was autism, but I started to wonder like, is there something different about how my brain's working that's creating some of these things? And the first thing that, you know, I did, I did some relentless Google searching like I did when I was trying to get sober and just read like the internet to try and find <laughs> my symptoms and ADHD was the thing that I discovered first and um which is obviously you know not to say popularize it but it has had a resurgence of and a big focus recently yeah. right so it's it's um not surprising that it came up as a top hit when you're yeah looking. and it turns out I do have inattention sorry there's a cat at Chelsea's you know just joining the interview yeah, sorry about that. There, there's a I do have inattentive ADHD, so I was I was actually on the wrong uh, the right track with that. Although I didn't find that out until later. So I think I suppose it is just that the stability maybe allowed me to realise certain things because I knew I'd started to work out I was incredibly introverted, and it took a lot of energy from me to be with people, even dearly beloved people. I still get like quite drained, not necessarily my partner, like the very inner circle, I can just, you know, ignore them. They don't count as people anymore. But even with my very best friends, I still get this like super drained kind of um, thing from being with them and, and, and tired out after like an hour or something. So I can't quite remember. I think what happened was just that work. Yeah, so that stability. And I suppose maybe seeing how my friends who had gotten sober with me were uh, were not having the difficulties that I was having with social anxiety. And, and I was like, there's still something going on with me. I don't know if it's like depression or anxiety or or what it is, but essentially it felt like just being really scared, I suppose. It just felt like being very scared of all the things I had to do. And um, and eventually 
it got so bad. I got so kind of overwhelmed with the stress of whatever it was that was going on with me that I got signed off work for a couple of weeks. And then because of that, I felt really, you know, it was getting in the way of my work. So I, I went to the doctors again. And, and finally, someone actually put me in touch with a psychiatrist, which has never, ever happened in all the times I've been to the GP. And this was before I got sober as well, just kind of going there, just like I'm not coping well, I'm not coping well. And uh, and someone referred me to a psychiatrist and then they didn't even notice it, actually. But I suppose what did happen? We had some conversations and, and they they thought that it wasn't a mood disorder. So it was kind of like a bit more evidence because I'd thought maybe I'm bipolar or it's um, the milder version of bipolar, which I've forgotten the name of right now. And they said it. they didn't think it was that because they thought it was it was related to the experiences I was having. So it wasn't sort of within me. It was more like in response to experiences I was having. And then actually what happened was I just was talking with a friend who's who, who's had a friend who was a special educational needs teacher. And it was through her that she just suggested, have you ever thought of autism because of the social anxiety um, and the other things that I've described oh the spiky profile they call it so being very strong in certain areas but almost like embarrassingly weak in other areas so you feel quite exposed quite often when you accidentally reveal one of your weaknesses in in public when you're an academic and uh and then she also taught me about this idea of masking which is you know for me a lot of the time just pretending that I understand what's going on more than I actually do and the level at which I was doing that, um, and then the anxiety that it can cause, trying to pretend you know what's going on at certain levels in your life is very stressful. So I just related hugely, and uh, and then I pursued a diagnosis, and, and yeah, they said I had what would be Asperger's if we still use that term, which is autism without accompanying intellectual disability. Um, yeah. Cool. Sorry, so that was a really lot <laughs> unload of, of your process, but I think it reflects that these things are quite messy and I, you go to different professionals, think you know, not quite knowing the answer, but knowing that there is something that needs to be addressed. And I think my key takeaway from my experiences and from seemingly yours is that, you know, at least without alcohol there, you've got, again, this foundation, so you know what the normal is. Um, and then it starts to reveal what still needs to be focused on, right? So whether that's, exactly. you know, for some people, it could be bipolar, it could be depression, it could be um, autism. And I want to touch upon, you talked about masking, and that's very much, it seems from a lot of the guidance that it's a very female focused response to autism in the sense that women or as young girls you become a bit more attuned to what is required from you at, in a social setting so you pick up on behaviors and mm -hmm. and kind of it becomes a bit performative right so you think I must ask these questions that's what everybody seems to do so I'll do those and uh, that's it's a great survival right mechanism and to merge in but it becomes very draining to do that masking for the rest of your life full time. Um, and there's a problem, I guess, there in terms of, you know, because your late diagnosis, and I'm sure a lot of women are increasingly diagnosed late. So can we talk a bit about the differences, I guess, between or challenges that there are as a female autistic person? Yeah, so I think there's that, that pressure to, um, or there's that expectation that you'll be relational as a female and so maybe you you work out quite quickly you're not going to get away with being a loner very easily whereas maybe the autistic male can there's a bit more of a an identity as just like oh he's just a lone male <laughs> he's a lone wolf or he's a or bachelor you know <laughs> <laughs> or a bachelor yeah um so i i don't know i'm not i'm not totally sure i suppose the thing that i find interesting is this idea that there's all of these women who haven't really been able to see themselves and and they've known that they don't quite fit into being a woman in some way. So I always just thought I was just like a terrible woman, you know, just really bad at being a woman and just couldn't do many of the things that it's that it would be that I wished I could do as a woman. I mean, I'm still embarrassed about 
how I can't cook very well, which is, sounds really sexist, I suppose, doesn't it? But I would feel kind of not very womanly with my skill set, which would then make me be, rebel against the ideas of femininity as well, because I'd be like, well, why should I be able to do these things? It's ridiculous. Gender doesn't even exist. And I would kind of question the whole thing, which is, again, a, quite an autistic experience. Um, I'm not sure if I know so much about about the differences I suppose, yeah, like it's just not very portrayed in the media. There aren't really many portrayals of autistic women. We don't have many of autistic men, but you do have this idea of sort of Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory and mm. Rain Man. I mean, they're not great representations, um, but you kind of at least maybe have something. But for women, we're not really sure what autistic women look like. And, and I think I get the sense that there are some parts of society are almost like spooked by the onslaught of autistic women that are sort of discovering themselves and actually really identifying with this this label because it it's sort of um for me it was very it allowed me to have a lot more compassion for myself and the struggles that I've had and maybe largely around gender gender stuff as well um it's kind of it's felt like a really nice <laughs> or a really um, healing thing to find that there is this place where I do fit quite well, actually, the autistic woman, whatever that is. <laughs> Create a new identity. And I think, you know, you're right, like the Sheldon example, it is quite an exaggerated form, although, again, he does not display sort of the learning difficulty side of autism um, that is also very prevalent. Um I was just thinking about women and gender and gender dysmorphia is also very much linked with autism. And I can mm. see that from a woman's perspective, mainly because it's almost like you don't understand how to do femininity or be like, you know, everything is a bit awkward. You know, you put something on, you're like, oh, this doesn't this doesn't feel right. Or, you know, yeah. something like that. And you know how or society tells you how you should feel and how you should look and so it's that dissonance there is like you know I'm not saying every female that feels this way is autistic but I think it's mm. another another uh, burden that perhaps is put on women of you know this is your gender straitjacket and yeah navigating that um, that's exactly how it cooking. felt to me that's so good this is your gender straitjacket and you just sort of you know I was sort of 13 and I was given my gender straitjacket and I was like no, I don't want this. But then you have to try and wear it because there's so many rewards for, you know, being successful in your gender. And it was, was quite punitive not to be successful in your gender when I was growing up in the 90s. You know, there were no safe spaces. So you just, everyone was out there. Like there was almost no nurturing around anywhere to be found. Like you're lucky if you had a school nurse or something. Well, exactly. And, you know, you think about the interconnectivity there between like drinking and then gender performativity. And, you know, you go out for a night out and the expectation is that you be in this gender straight, particularly in like norm, uh, heteronormative clubs. You know, it's like yeah. you are supposed to dress up in this way. And if you turn up in protest of that in your dungarees and whatever, you know, you're not really going to make the cut. So that's an interesting um uh, sort of synergy I guess between those two but I was thinking when gender differences I was thinking of autism I was more thinking about things like um, you know having read a bit around uh, males tend to, they tend to ascribe you know this obsession with trains or cars that seems mm -hmm. to come up regularly and you're like no I am not obsessed with trains or cars um, and again you know why isn't it dolls or you know I don't know like other other toys but I feel like it's all scheduled around um what they predict like young boys mm. would show or struggle with and that sort of thing rather than number one as an adult but number two as a female yeah so and there's the thing about something that can be observed for autistic girls is whether they play with their toys or whether they sort of more arrange their toys or kind of engage in sensory play with their toys so when I was a kid what my favorite way to play with toys was just to brush the pony's hair you know I just did I just brushed the pony's hair I didn't really do a lot of I didn't really know how to play so much certainly not with other children I was a bit confused by that mm. and I would just sort of stand on the sides work out 
you know what the humans were doing it's not that I thought of it <laughs> in that way and then sort of join in but then there'd always there'd often be a point where I was like not doing it right or something for reasons that I didn't understand and I'd you know it become a bit of a joke the way that I thought the game worked or something and yeah it, so it actually became very stressful trying to play was actually quite stressful because so much of the things that apparently for neurotypical children that they're a they start being able to do innately I was still having to consciously think about that so it was just yeah I guess it just wasn't very fun it was actually quite hard work to be playing so I'd prefer to be by myself and then the other thing is with with females they can tend to be similarly obsessive interest or similarly yeah similarly special specialist interests but they might be less noticeable so uh it might be like really interested in a particular band or a tv show and know everything about it or be able to quote from it and things like that so that maybe slight make you seem slightly odd <laughs> delightfully <laughs> quirky yeah, exactly. exactly yeah so you know you might get a little repu- a reputation for being a bit different in those sorts of ways but no one would ever kind of ascribe it to autism because it's not that different interest wise from what the other girls are interested in it's just yeah, the degree to which you're into it. I was just thinking that about obsessions around like uh, boy bands and things and how that is almost like, again, a strength, gender straitjacket of like, this is expected of young girls. So why would we identify this as something that's wrong? But I guess it's about the level of obsession um, and what are we obsessive about? Uh, that's, again, caveat this with not all uh, girl yeah. fans of things are autistic, but thinking about the play example something which uh, sort of you know instead of asking about obsessiveness with cars you know it could you know the questions that they ask around in diagnosis could be more around like the way that you play exactly like you were saying and I think some of it is just about like opting out you know thinking about can the child actually use their imagination you know do they have an imagination or are they choosing activities which don't require imagination and things around that i know autistic children have sometimes have difficulties with that so um mm. it's just a challenge when you know if you are a female that's going through that diagnosis phase um you know if you look at the criteria or you're being not um denied but you know where you're sort of struggling to convey the issues against sort of the criteria which seem quite um, dedicated towards the masculine yeah the the criteria is very much biased towards the masculine and there was the study about this idea of it being extreme male brain by um baron cohen not sasha baron cohen um but his brother i can't remember his name right now but and that that's really kind of misdirected uh, misdirected people for such a long time and in fact the DSM actually acknowledged the bias within within autism diagnosis so I think it is becoming incredibly well known that it isn't necessarily that there's more autistic men but just they've been able to spot them because of the diagnostic tools being able to find them so I think there is it's very likely that there's going to be parity ultimately with with autis- autism across genders I I, I believe. I mean, it's seeming that way with the the explosion of late diagnosed autistic women who often get diagnosed because they they see they recognise uh, th- this in their child or it's recognised in their child, and then they know that now that it kind of passes down family lines. So they might sort of look to the parents, mm. and then they're often finding that you know women are getting diagnosed that way. My goodness, the challenges of, you know, having children with, auti- you know, being autistic and then having a child who then may also be autistic is a whole nother level of, um, you know, I'm sure confusion and difficulty yeah. that, you know, and neither of us, I don't think, can sort of speak to that exactly right now. Um, I just want to bring the connection between autism and alcohol sort of more to the fore. Mm. So how from the research we know very little right about the relationship between autism and alcohol but what was your experience do you think around that um i suppose i my drinking really started to be problematic when i was 13 when i got my gender straight jacket actually and i think that was i think they were really related i think it just started to feel impossible to live in a way 
And so I started to just really look forward to that kind of getting out of it thing at the at the weekend. And um, and so I, I feel like a part of that was probably autism as well, you know, like the gender stuff not making any sense to me and feeling very oppressive. Like it didn't see some, I suppose some of my female friends found a lot of the dressing up part fun. But for me, that was another, you know, maybe I would enjoy having a drink and getting dressed up with my friends, but it wasn't really my thing at all. And I'd often just feel like I'd be, be really self-conscious of the noise my heels made or like how the makeup felt on my face. I'd be really distracted by it all and I couldn't just relax and enjoy myself. I'd feel sort of freakish and strange. Um, so I suppose I, when looking back, I can see that autism was probably playing, playing quite a big part in the way that I drank. And um, I, I drank a lot. I used to drink a lot just to be around people. And it would just have to be a little bit just to be around people. So it was very much like med medicine, you know, just I worked out that one bottle of lager made me feel normal and confident. And then I could just say, have a conversation with my cousins at the family party or something. But without the bottle of lager, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I think um, you call it self-esteem juice, don't you? Self-esteem juice on the on the blog, yeah. It was it's like self-esteem juice, you know, and it, it was two pounds a pint when I was kind of growing up. So it was just oh, an again. absolute no-brainer. Um, and then I think that because it kind of made me normal and confident to have a drink and to feel normal and confident, I think that then, you know, it became really essential and it allowed me to socialise. And so I just never really recognised that difficulty that I had socializing because there was no problem getting hold of alcohol it was very easy and no one was telling me off about it it seemed to be encouraged you know it was everywhere and no one was having an issue with how I drank and so I just sort of continued in that way but then when I was getting sober I and I was still going to AA after I'd got my diagnosis and I was listening to the way people talked about like always feeling on the outside of things and not knowing how to connect with people and not knowing how to, you know, like they would look at the children and they'd be like, how are they doing that? How do they know how to start the conversation? How do they know how to end it? And they just always felt this strange alien feeling. And I was like, oh my God, how many of us are autistic in here? And, and what, <laughs> what's going on? And I just started to wonder about it. And then as I looked into the research, I discovered that there just seemed to be a real relationship where alcohol just works an absolute treat for those of us who are autistic it just it sort of takes facilitates away. that masking right so it's another yeah. tool in the masking process yeah it facilitates the masking that's a really good way of putting it so it, it, it sort of um it allows you to feel less uncomfortable with masking for such a long time and it also allows you to feel less you know less sort of policing everything that you're saying and doing you can just sort of relax and say and do whatever you want but then of course the payoff of the next day mm. the anxiety might be pretty strong but yes you know, agree so moment, it like switches off the noise in your head right for that moment and then it kind of doubles yeah. up the noise volume on the next day or the day after yeah. or the next yeah. next month exactly there's <laughs> also something that I started to identify in the research but have you know I can't completely prove yet but I've started to notice um not only do autistic people use alcohol to sort of numb the discomfort of masking and social situations but then there does seem to be like the hangover, say, for instance, is in more intolerable because of that sensory sensitivity. So there can be a, um, like for me, one of the reasons I got sober was because hangovers were becoming excruciating and unbearable. So and I could see with my friends, say we'd all drink the same amount. We'd all have gone for a drink and then ended up getting, you know, drinking a lot of drinks. And then say we had to do something the next day, I often would be the one who couldn't do the thing or who could do the thing, but had to constantly be sitting on the floor or be almost being carried around because I was so I was so disabled by hangovers. And um, that seems to be I wonder if there's something there as well, that there's like it worked really well for me, but also like it was very punishing on me as well that, you know, I couldn't sort of manage mm. But also, I think on that note, again, with women, we expect women to be a lightweight. And especially if you're a slim build woman, you know, the explanation of you processing this alcohol really badly, you know, you've got so many reasons for that. It's difficult to then ascribe it to autism. Right. But it could be yeah. another another factor in there. 
Um, oh, definitely, yeah. But I just I just remember certain things being like whenever I was hungover, I'd have to pull my hair back really tight, and if one hair touched my face, it would be just I would be just I would seem very sensitive in a slightly insane way, and I would just have to sort of live through it. And it, yeah, it just was. I just feel like the sensory discomfort of being hungover or having poisoned myself with alcohol was just oh my gosh I mean it's unbearable for anyone I suppose but yeah I wonder I wonder about that like exacerbated it and I think that brings us on to the fact that you know there is very little research about autism generally and then autism with alcohol um, and other drugs if we want to expand it to that and so you're currently on a steering committee aren't you with the Society of the Study of Addiction Yes. Yeah, that's right. I can. Yeah. So there's been um, a steering committee created uh, and it's funded by the Society for the Study of Addiction. So it's called the acronym is SABA and it's Substance, Alcohol and Behavioural Addictions in Autism. And it's a research it's a priority setting kind of committee. And the hope is to identify the directions in which research needs to go to bring these silos together of kind of addiction research and autism research because there seems to be such a huge crossover but there isn't very much that deals with um with both so there's a survey that we have out at the moment which we really want people who have experience uh, of autism or maybe autism in the family or addiction or autism and addiction like me um, so we want people to to take part in this survey and it's a slightly strange survey in that it's asking for questions so it asks mm. questions but it wants you to respond with questions which people find confusing um, and the idea is that then we're going to kind of get in all of these questions and see what is it that people care about most and need to answer most. And one of the things that I care about most in this subject is how can people wanting to get sober who are autistic, how can they access that help without necessarily having to, you know, so say AA, for instance, was it's a very, it's an incredibly social model. And I struggled with it because of my social anxiety. And I think I was quite lucky that I was able to push through and, and make that work for me. And I think I know that a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that because for a lot of autistic people I'm reading, alcohol is sort of the difference between them being able to socially engage and not. You know, so it's it works really well, um, but also it, it turns out that more autistic people or autistic people are at a higher risk of addiction and I think that is just because it works so well so mm. you repeat the behavior and like I say the research isn't completely out on on that at all but if we're you know if autistic women are using alcohol more often because it's effective to mask and then there's also this idea um that women uh, autistic women and masking that's there's like an increased um correlation with suicidality and suicide ideation so the kind of the the burden of masking so consistently and then we also know that alcohol is connected with suicidality anyway so it just feels like there's some really important things that need to be sort of considered here and particularly this idea of treatment for autistic women that works but also like how can we offer a better alternative than alcohol in the first place so find those kids receiving the gender straight jacket we have, maybe should stop saying that but say you know young women who might need a bit more support in finding themselves and finding where they fit because they're autistic how can you give them a better alternative than finding alcohol and then just trying to swerve the difficult work of forging an identity which is what I attempted and then you end up like in your 30s doing that doing that important work having to relearn it yeah and I think I think there's so that's the study or the questionnaire that there are Saba are asking I think is you know I think the key takeaway there is they're trying to improve treatment outcomes right treatment outcomes yeah. for autism treatment outcomes for addiction and then the tr the combined treatment outcomes of if two people sort of are uh, sorry one person is on both of those uh, mm -hmm. in both of those groups um so I, I think that's more to do with I was thinking it, you know, 
people's answers to this survey are essentially going to shape how money and funding is spent around this research. So that's why it's it's quite important if you have things that you want to know or like you're not sure about, it's a great way of trying to shape how that money is being spent. It is. And also there aren't so far enough autistic people replying. So, I mean, I know this isn't necessarily a forum that's going to reach especially autistic people, but if anyone can pass it on to autistic friends or family members, that's so important because, you know, so much of the research around autism, it, it it's increasingly it's being informed by autistic people. You know, I'm on the steering committee, so I, I can say certain things, but it's often being led by people working in the field or people with autistic family members. And that's not always the same we don't, this, the priorities setting wouldn't necessarily always agree from both camps. So it's super important to get um, autistic people filling out the survey as well. Yeah, like autistic adults rather than the parents of autistic children as well. So a big spread. Um, we've got the link that we are going, we'll send out the link to that survey along with uh, Chelsea's um, blogs, both Beautiful Hangover and a Polite Robot that we'll send out sort of when we follow up with this sort of stuff as well on social media so that will go out then um, I'm conscious that we've sort of hit the hour mark and so it kind of brings us to the end of that chat but thank you so much for spending the time talking about not only your experiences in of alcohol addiction but also um, then autism I know it's quite it's hard enough for anybody let alone again an autistic person there's issues of burnout you know it's, it's just <laughs> exhausting talking to me I'm sure um, but it's been a pleasure to sort of have someone on to talk about these intersections thank you thanks so much for making it uh, an informal thing because you knew that I was <laughs> struggling with energy at the moment I really appreciate that that's all right no problem um, and then we'll be back in or well, meet the scholar will be back in December um, when I'll be talking about my research as well so thinking about women in online sobriety communities so exactly sort of the demographic of club sober but we will leave it there and um, thanks so much Chelsea thank you Claire